Valor Ministries, Voices and Love, Offering Redemption, presents Right on Time. This morning's sermon is entitled, And the Walls Came a Tumbling Down. I've been preaching a few years now. I love to preach. But every now and then you get a sermon you're excited about. This is one of them. I sit here this morning, and last night I sat here a while, and throughout the week. And if I looked at what we took on here, the responsibility is overwhelming. Though financially, we're actually in better shape than we were. But I am truly overjoyed to be able to bring the Word of God to you this morning. Amen. Now, some of you are going to say you forgot something this morning, the offering. I didn't. We're going to take the offering after I'm through preaching this morning. And there's a purpose for that. You'll see. Every now and then we got to change things up, otherwise we become rote. We become like the Philistines doing the same thing over and over so everybody can see us. That is not the purpose of this church. Today, we're going to talk about how the world poses a threat to our victory. Like Jericho, to our victory in our Christian life. But, how the scripture shows us how God can and will bring down the walls of the things that would prevent us from victory in our lives. Amen. Now, we read Joshua, the chapter 6 chapter. Let's set the scene this morning. Joshua, who was the master military strategist, presenting his plan for taking Jericho to the generals. He was the Eisenhower of the day as Eisenhower was to World War II. Amen. Eisenhower is famous that he put all of the countries together and they finally beat the Germans. And fortunately, because of his great military strategy, even though millions or tens of thousands of people were lost, we don't speak German today. We get to speak English and we get to proclaim the gospel. Amen. Well, here he was with all of his knowledge and cunning and wisdom and he was going to be put to the test in this strategy. And what does he propose? He tells them they're going to walk around the city. What? Yeah, you're going to walk around the city. Now, here's a true beam me up Scotty moment. What in the world is he talking about? I'm sure the people thought he had lost his ever-loving mind. The first major milestone for living a victorious Christian life is to commit yourself to God's plan Amen. in your life by crossing the Jordan with no possibility of returning across that river. Amen. When the first time, I preached about this a few weeks ago, that they crossed out of Egypt, and they got over, and a few weeks later, what were they saying? Man, let's go back to Egypt. Let's get back over there. What, 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 what's going to happen to us? We need to be able to set our course and set it true and straight and not cross back across that. Amen. I'm going to give you a little example. Sister uh, Woodward reads scripture to me often in the mornings. Thank you, sis, incidentally. And... One of the stories recently that I had heard, and I'm not sure it was from you, but in one of the scriptures it was given, is a story of a woman who came forth for healing. And lo and behold, the pastor lays his hands upon her, and he's ready, and they pray for her, and as soon as he says amen, what he's ready to say to her is, now there may not be instant healing God can handle naturally, but as he went to say those words, she raised up her hand, started shouting, I'm healed! I'm healed! He was trying to hedge his bet. Instead of crossing that Jordan 
and realizing, yeah, sometimes there is natural healing. But when we pray for people, we should reasonably expect that they could be healed, even supernaturally. Amen. The second major hurdle we face is the world, which stands on our way like the mighty Jericho. The world is so pervasive, so present, so powerful, and so promiscuous that it seems impossible to resist or overcome it. I ask you this morning, what's the Jericho in your life? The world system, worldly attitudes, worldly habits? Well, probably not most of that for this congregation. But anything that stands directly in your way of serving God is your Jericho. You say, Pastor, the world's a mess. Why bother overcoming the world in our lives? Well, I got three good reasons. One, it'll choke you to death if you don't. Mark, the fourth chapter of the 18th and 19th verse. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in, and then it says it point blank, and choke the word and proves unfruitful. Right. Number two, it is either or. Matthew 6 and 24, no one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You can't serve God. Some translations say mammon, some say money. I say evil. It's either God or it's not. Three, we are dead to it. Galatians 6, 14, but far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me, and most importantly, I'm crucified to the world. Amen. So today, I want to look at Joshua 6 in terms of the victory that God gave Israel, and as a pattern for how God gives us a victory over the world, a sort of 12-step program to the victorious Christian life. Verses 1 and 2, and I'm reading out of the New International Version. Now Jericho was tightly shut up because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came in. Yeah, out and no one came in. In other words, Israel put Jericho under siege. They were trapped. The Lord said to Joshua, see, I, have I love this, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. Verses 1 and 2 I just read. Now if you're Joshua, and you're standing by this mighty wall, and it's shut up tight, and it seems impenetrable, how are we getting through this 30 foot? Imagine it was just you and you got to get through this building. And there's no glass entrance to come through. And they had built ramps, and their entrances were up three and four stories to get up into that city. And God says, see, I've given you the city. And I'm going, huh? What? Yeah, that's a great thing, but I don't see that I've got it. And God, exactly how is this city ours? But the verb given, used here, indicates the battle had already been won. Amen. The Israelites had not encountered a walled city before and were totally inadequate in the flesh to this task. How often are we inadequate to the task God calls us to, to do? So then God doesn't explain how he has given them the city. He just goes on with this battle plan. And it's a doozy. Verses 3 through 5. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. Seventh day, march around the city seven times when the priests blow in the trumpets. What? Now, if I told you we were going to war and this is what I told you we were going to do, what would you say to me? Where's the other army? The walking around Jericho might 
have confused the people inside Jericho. And put them a little off their game going, what in the world are these nuts doing? Sometimes, get this, sharing the love of Jesus takes people off guard. If you don't believe that, wander around and have meals with Dave Woodward. He talked people off guard all the time. And they got their walls up, and guess what? Those walls come tumbling down. Jesus takes his people off guard and opens them up for the Lord to draw them to himself. Now God uses trumpets throughout this to announce very important things. In the Bible he announces things like the rapture of the church and the judgments against the world. Trumpets were used to call Moses into God's presence. Exodus 19, for those that are taking notes, to declare the run up to the day of atonement. Leviticus chapter 23. And they were used to call to battle in Numbers chapter 10. Numbers 10, 8, 9. And when you go to war in your land against the adversary who, what, oppress you, you shall sound an alarm with the trumpets. That's why I wanted Dave to play those trumpets this morning. We've sounded an alarm to the city of Pontiac. That you may be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. There in Numbers, trumpets were also used to declare joy in the Lord over the burnt offerings and festivals. They shall be remembered for you before your God. And the Bible says, I am the Lord your God. Amen. So hearing the trumpets was for Israel an audible reminder of who is God, that they belong to him. And for Jericho, it was a trumpet of coming judgment. It was. Verses 6 through 14. The people in Jericho have got to be wondering what kind of strange army they're encountering. They've never seen anything like this. I suppose they might have thought the Israelites were doing something magical or superstitious. Though that's simply conjecture on my part. There's no scriptural indication of it. But they had to be thinking there's something crazy about this. They just keep walking around our city. And all they see are armed men, not using those weapons, priests with horns, and the veiled Ark of the Covenant. There's an instance where the Israelites mistook the Lord for superstition. In 1 Samuel, the fourth chapter, the Israelites thought that superstitious power of the Ark would defeat the Philistines. Guess what? Survey says, and. Eh. It's not using God's ark for our purposes. It's God using the ark for his purpose. Amen. God told them to take the ark around Jericho. This was never repeated. In the same way, we sometimes as Christians use the trappings of the church, thinking that they hold the answer. We go through rituals, say our rote prayers, that once had meaning, or we do something that we've always done, or just think that by going into a church, that that'll be enough. Isn't that what the world thinks this day and age? Yes. It's not the presence of the ark of God that mattered. It was the presence of God in the ark. Amen. What is the ark today? You are carrying around the presence of God. Amen. It's God's presence in your life. Not some ritual, not some superstition, some, not some grand cathedral that will make the difference in victory. Verses 15 and 16 of that sixth chapter. Frank marched around the city seven times in the same manner, except that on that day they circled the city seven times. The seventh time around. When the priest sounded the trumpet blast, Joshua commanded the people, oh, you know I got to do it, shout! <laughs> For the Lord has given you the city. Amen. The number seven occurs quite a few times in this chapter. It is, it is the Lord's number and the number of completion. And so there's a lot of symbolism going on in the sixth chapter of Joshua. This is God completely gaining the victory over this city. It is also representing God's grace. 
He gave the people of Jericho an entire week to repent. Yeah. But did they? No. The ark represents God's presence. We need to have God's presence with us and in us when we fight the battles and seek to overcome the world in our lives. Amen. That means, one, we invite him into our lives and into our weaknesses. For he shall make them strong. We act in a way, this is one of the things the church has lost. We act in a way that's pleasing to God. Amen. And quite honestly, to hell with what man thinks. Winning over the world by the world's means does not work. Amen. Preach it. When indeed our services look more like the pop culture than they do the reverence and worship, we've made a wrong turn. Yep. Cutting dependence on money by cheating on your taxes or cutting your tithes and offerings doesn't give God any glory. That's true. Having an affair but staying married doesn't make you obedient to God. In this promiscuous society, I'm hearing churches go, Oh, but, you know, if something's wrong in your marriage and you're straight, but you stay married, God will honor that. Oh, man, what bad theology. Lord, and men, men we make excuses. I didn't leave my wife. I was, I was faithful in that I stayed married. And you know that she's going through the change, and she's moody, and no longer wants me to touch her, and I just needed some physical comfort. Men, hooey! We make every excuse in the world can't just stay married. You stay faithful. Amen. And that isn't just in the physical marriage. It's in our marriage to Jesus Christ. For we are the bride of Christ. Uh, Ephesians chapter 3, 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask. And I love this, those two little words. All abundantly more than we ask or even think. And boy, I can think pretty big. You all know in my boat. But more than even I can think, according to the power at work within us. To him be the glory of the church in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Verses 17 through 19. This was a kind of first fruits victory, and so everything was dedicated to God. Sort of like today. Everything we do dedicated to God. We need to realize that all our victories in our lives belong to God. Plus, everything we have or are or everything we will be is God. He won't ask that we always use everything in service to him. If, just the same as he didn't have to, 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 the Israelites destroy every single city. But we need to realize he could, and we should be willing to give him everything. Verses 20 and 21. The fall of Jericho is a study of faith. God used it to tell them without a doubt that he, and only he, was the one doing the fighting. Amen. They didn't have to lift a finger. All they had to do was walk. Only join in what God was doing. It's also a type of the world. The world hears the loud trumpet call of the gospel warning, warning them constantly of the danger they're in. I want this church to be a beacon of warning the people of Pontiac the danger they're in. One day God will blow a trumpet, seven trumpets actually, and the world will collapse, will fall down just as the walls of Jericho. Now unbelievers tell you that what I am saying this morning is a fairy tale, but I'm here this morning to state no, declare, and raise my voice that Jesus is coming again. And those who don't know him will face a fiery future. Those of us who have surrendered our lives to Jesus Christ will reign with him, not because of anything we did to deserve it, but because he accepted our simple sinner's prayer and totally and completely forgave us. And that's no fairy tale. Amen. As a type of the world for the believer, the walls appear high and mighty. 
as our challenges and difficulties in life in this day and age, what we call the millennial days, seems and appear sometimes insurmountable. But they are really like movie sets. When you look behind it, there's nothing behind those front walls. If you push on them, they fall down. Satan's like a roaring lion, but he has no right to those who belong to Jesus Christ. So too the cares of the world appear so big, but fall as we declare God's truth and put our faith and our trust in him. Rather than focusing on the height of the walls, its sickness, etc., etc., we focus on God. Therein lies the complete and total victory. Amen. That must be our outline as we open the doors next week to the people to come in to this house. Verse 22 and 23, only one part of the wall remained standing. That was Rahab's house. Verse 24 through 26, Jericho was then destroyed by Joshua. Now, one of the things it said is, don't anybody rebuild this thing. You think they listened? It was rebuilt by a guy named, a guy named Hiel, 1 Kings 16 and 34. It was later destroyed in 3 BC by the Herodians. It was rebuilt again by the Archelaus. Pastor, pronounce that for me. By the Archelaus. Is that right? A-R-C-H-E-L-A-U-S. Acropolis. Thank you. Which stood in Jesus' day and was destroyed then by the Vespians in 68 AD. Verse 27, the Lord was with Joshua. I want to say that the Lord was with the Cathedral of Valor. Amen. Now let's look at quickly some of the lessons in the book this morning. I was talking to Sister Linda Woodward earlier this week shared her with the sermon title and the topic so that she could prepare the weekly lesson for our kids here in the church. Incidentally, thank you, sis. And she said to me, didn't we just build the walls in last week's sermon? And now we're going to tear them down again this week? I told her now she could feel what it was like to be an Israelite. Building them and tearing them down. Building them and tearing them down. Building them tearing them down. Why was this? Because they would repent and God would bless them, and then they would slip back into their disobedient and rebellious ways. And round and round they went like a terrifying merry-go-round. Do not use them as the example. Be faithful in your marriage to Christ. Amen. You know, you look at this story and you go, seemingly folly. When Christ said go around or God said go around, my question would have been, you want us to do what? The inner wisdom of it, do what God commands no matter how counterintuitive. Three, the deeper meaning of it. God and man in cooperation in pulling down satanic strongholds. And the utter triumph. The entire city falls with not one Israelite casualty. Perhaps this morning feels like Jericho. When you hear the trumpet sound, it, is it judgment you hear? Or is it victory you hear? This morning I'm declaring victory in Pontiac. It's not too late, too late to repent, just as Rahab, Rahab did and declare that you belong to God. 2 Corinthians 2, 15 and 16. For we are the aroma of Christ to God, among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. Literally they know who we are. Yeah. To one fragrance from death to death, to the other a fragrance from life to life. For us Christians, what are your Jerichos this morning, church? Is there influence of the world system in your life that is opposed to following Jesus Christ? Is there a care or a worry that keeps you from loving and trusting God? Is there a problem that you just don't seem to be able to overcome? So you're trying to solve it in the natural way. 
or worse, solve it on your own. We can have victory over the world in our lives. We need to walk around our Jericho, literally, worldly attitudes and systems that seem so strong, and survey them, realizing they are really just false fronts, like the old Western movies. We need in our ears not the shouts of conformity from the enemy, but conformity to what? The Word of God. And a reminder of the reality that we belong to God, and He's judged the world. We need to see in front of us not the high walls, but the ark. The presence of God in our hearts, changing us into His image. Good change, sis. And then, we need to shout our defiance to the world and see those things that seem so strong come tumbling down for us to destroy. Church, be willing to do the things in a way that seems silly or <laughs> slightly insane. I know what you're thinking. You're saying, Pastor, with you as the pastor, we're pretty sure that the slightly insane things probably going to happen. Instead of confronting a situation, perhaps do nothing but just to pray about it. Only and give it to God. Instead of running out and getting a third job, you hold up your needs to God. Let God's presence go with you. Amen. When you attack the world, do it in a way that glorifies God. Sometimes you just shut up. And don't attack the world on your own. Just let God, let the walls come tumbling down. Don't think you have all the answers. The answers are in the book. Wait on the Lord and be patient. Be patient for him to speak to you. And incidentally, that voice comes through the word of God. And occasionally through the pastor's explanation of the word of God. Let God be announced from your life first, the trumpets before the shout. As God's words come out of your pores, you will find the walls of the world's attitudes come tumbling down. Amen. It's not your wisdom, it's God's. Amen. Watch, church, for the walls that have bound the city of Pontiac for this last 40-some years. I remember before the Detroit race riots that this was a fun, an unbelievably great town. Now I know this has got to be something for the Woodwards. They started their church life together three blocks from here. And the church abandoned Pontiac and went to Auburn Hills. Woodward's your home. And we're going to retake this city Amen. for Jesus Christ. And the walls! come tumbling down. Sometimes we don't recognize when God is actually moving attitudes and values. Times are changing. That's the time to grab the victory over the habit of the pattern. Let's devote the victory to God. Instead of just going back to the same old patterns, let's fill this empty space with relationships with God our Father and Jesus Christ his Son and the Holy Spirit indwelling in us. And finally, consider the words that we read in Proverbs. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And don't lean to your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your straight path, your straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with your first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will burst with wine. Now this morning, remember that part about being pastor in the little insanity part? Welcome to my world. We're going to be a little bit of insanity this morning. 
The people of Israel did what to Jericho? They marched around it. Give one of those to your brother, please. what we're going to do this morning? We're going to take this piece of paper. We're going to get up. We're going to go back to the church. We're going to put our coats on. And we're going to silently, while having this in our hand, march around this block one time. Literally. Just as they did there. Say, Pastor, are you kidding? No. It was good enough for the Israelites. It's good enough for us. How many want to see souls saved here in in Pontiac? How many of you want to personally lead people to the Lord in Pontiac? We're going to go around there. Then we're going to come back into this sanctuary. Brother Woodward, you can blow a big note on that trumpet, can't you? Then we're going to shout. (laughs) She does scare the geese away all the time. Then we're going to shout. And then we'll take our offering. Are everybody on board with me? And the walls... Come tumbling down. Get your coach, come on. And it is nippy outside, so we can walk quickly. It's okay. We'll follow past. I do. Which way does it walk? We're going to walk right around this way. Clock right, yeah. Clock right.
I told you I was excited about this sermon this morning. I know other people on the street will go, what in the world are those people doing on Sunday morning? Brother Woodward gets that trumpet out wherever he went. Right there. After he blows, what I want us to shout is this. And the walls of Pontiac came tumbling down. And I mean shouted. Brother Woodward!
Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face to shine upon thee. Be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. To God only wise.